Hi everyone and welcome to the next chapter on Nimzovich's My System. This time we'll look at chapter 6 which is entitled The Elements of Endgame Strategy. Nimzovich opens the chapter with a general introduction and mentions that even great club players can play very credible middle games only to fall apart completely when the endgame arrives. He emphasizes that of course it's necessary to be able to play the endgame just as well as the middle game. Indeed, endgame ability is what separates the men from the boys at all levels. Naturally, the endgame has a completely different modus operandi in comparison to the middle game, and it's necessary to reevaluate everything once the endgame is reached. Nimzovich goes on to say that it is in the endgame itself that the small advantages we have so painstakingly built up throughout the earlier stages of the game are realized. Of course, additional advantages are to be sought in the endgame as well. Nimzovich then breaks the endgame down to its elements, one of which was covered in an earlier chapter, the past pawn. There is also centralization, with the subtitle Using the King, Shelters and Bridge Building. Secondly, there is the issue of aggressively posted pieces. Third is the notion of welding together isolated troops. After that comes the idea of general advance for all pieces. And finally, there is the materialization of files and the uses of those files, another element that we have already looked at in earlier chapters. So firstly, we'll consider centralization. The first piece we'll consider with regard to centralization is the king, whose excellent mobility constitutes a very important factor in endgame strategy. In order to get the king active, he must of course be brought closer to the scene of the action, wherever that might be. As a general rule, the king should move towards the center at the start of the endgame. From there, it will have the option of going to either side, as becomes necessary. Nimzovich humorously depicts the following. The king slowly approaches the center, and when he has arrived, he brings together all his ministers and advisers, eats a hearty breakfast, consults his ministers, has another breakfast, because unlike mortals, kings eat two breakfasts, then consults again with his council, and only then concludes where the battleground lays. Nimzovich is implying that the king likes to take his time, and indeed there's no choice with this. However, it's a lesser known fact that the king has an attacking strength of four, i.e. superior to both bishop and knight. Okay, so let's look at an example. Take the position here. The end game has emerged and it's safe for the king to enter the game. White plays king f2 in order to bring the king to c2 to defend the b-pawn, after which his rook is free to roam the d-file and beyond. For example, king f7, king e2, king e6, king d1, king f5, king c2, Rook b6, the rook was attacked, now rook d7. And white's advantage is growing considerably. Here's another example. This position was reached by Nimzovich with black against Rubenstein at Karlsbad in 1907. And uh, Rubenstein has, uh, sorry, started with knight c3 because the immediate centralization of the king is problematic. For example, if king f1, bishop c4 check, king, king e1 is the only move that makes sense, and now bishop d5 attacking the knight and x-raying the g2 pawn is going to force an exchange of pieces because if the knight moves then g2 falls. Either way, white is hopelessly lost. So Rubenstein, who was a superb endgame player, elected for knight c3 first of all. So bishop c4 from Nimzovich, preventing the king from coming out, so f4 to play king f2 and so on. Then followed king e7, king f2, king d6, king e3, king c5. Rubenstein had missed the proper moments to get in contact with the d4 square. Black's king making it to the c5 square is the decisive centralization that Nimzovich achieved here. He points out that if White's king 
was on d4 and the black king was on d6, the win would be a lot more difficult. Rubenstein continued with g4. So now comes king b4. And gaining access to this square is the reason why getting to c5 was so important. It acts as a stepping stone for the king, which can now attack the knight. And if it moves, then this pawn is going to queen. So king d4. And uh, if black plays a4 now, then knight takes a4 as possible. King takes a4, king takes c4. And uh, so that's no good. So first, bishop b3. Now g5, because white's just going to be tied up otherwise. a4, knight b1, and uh, bishop e6. And Nimzovich gives no reason for not advancing the pawn immediately. We can only assume that he wanted to prevent the f5 push, although black is, of course, still winning in all lines with this extra piece. But perhaps it takes longer to win. And there's a lot more to squeeze out of the position before taking decisive action. So g3, king b3, knight c3, a3, king d3, and g6. And now Zugzwang is not far away. It's white can't advance any of these pawns. So we see that advancing straight away on the queen side here, although it was winning the knight, there might have been some counterplay or some kind of drawing chance for um, white here if you'd done that. So, it's, you know, it's always easy to see an instant threat, but if there's more to squeeze out of the position before carrying out that threat, then often it's the best way to play. So king d4, and now king c2. And there's the Zugzwang. And uh, Rubenstein resigned here. So it was brilliantly played endgame by Nimzovich. In the comments afterwards, he highlights how the central advance in such endgames is performed not only to create more space to maneuver for our own king, but also to limit the space available to our opponent's king. Fighting for a single square is often the ultimate result. Therefore, Nimzovich concludes, it is essential to bring your king to as central a position as possible, as quickly as it can be done if for no other reason than to deprive your opponent's king of options and squares. Nimzovich then em emphasizes how centralization, of course, does not apply only to kings. The other pieces must be considered as well. In this position, white can play knight d4, follow up with e3, and bring his king to the center. Centralizing the knight here, and in general, tends to achieve two things. Firstly, it keeps an eye on both wings of the board from this great central square. Secondly, it limits the scope of the opposing king. If both sides also had a rook, for example, the, uh, sorry, yeah, it's another point to make. If they both sides had a rook, and this d pawn wasn't here, and the rook was firing down, after e3, the knight would make a protective shield for the king to maneuver behind and uh, you know centralize for a uh, best possible way forwards and Nimzovich then goes on to illustrate the same point in a queen endgame as well as the other pieces the queen is also at its most effective when posted in the center of the board this position is an ideal with the queen posted centrally protecting all of the white pawns the uh, white king is free to go on long expeditions around the board. Here he's going to reach either b6 or g6, win a pawn, and the game. Now we move on to the issue of shelters and bridge building, something which is a crucial element of the end game. It's white to move here. If you want to try and figure out the correct approach, then stop the video now. Pushing the pawn is a mistake because it exposes the king to a storm of checks. For example, if a7, now rook a2, and white would probably try something like king b6 to protect the pawn so the rook can come out and the pawn can queen. But now rook b2 check, king a6, rook a2 check, king b6, rook b2 check, and so on. And uh, if white goes the other way, sorry, after uh, rook b2 checks to uh, king c6, then rook a2, and you know, white has made no progress. So correct instead 
of a7 is king b6 and this reserves the a7 square as a shelter for the king. Now for example might come rook b1 check, king a7 and now white's winning quickly. For example rook b2, rook b8, rook a2, rook b6 and this creates a second shelter so the king can move away from the pawn and the pawn can queen. So rook a1, king b7, there's no checks and this pawn is queening and the game is easily won. Bridge building is another very important part of endgames, especially rook endgames. Again, it's white to move here, and if you want to try and figure out the correct way to play, then stop the video now. Rook e4 is the move. Very nice. Playing instead king f7 to try and queen the pawn achieves nothing. Rook f1 check, king g6, rook g1 check, king h7, rook h1 check, king g8, rook g1, and so on. Again, white has made no progress. After rook e4, instead, uh, for example, rook h2 to at least stop the king moving to the h-file, but he also has the f-file, the king. So king f7, rook f2 check, king g6, and now if rook g2 check, the point is that after king f6, rook f2 check leads to king g5. And now black's running out of checks because rook g2 check is met by rook g4. And this is the point of rook e4. And after anything else, the pawn is queening. And you know, in this way, the g5 square becomes a shelter for the king. And uh, black does have another option after uh, king f6. Um, instead of rook f2 check, rook g1, you know, to keep this pressure up. And now white shifts the entire bridge and the shelter up a rank with rook e5. And we can see the shelter and the bridge going to be here. And the shelter is at g6, and the rook will move at g5 in order to create the bridge. And it's interesting to note that playing rook e5 instead of rook e4 in the initial position makes the win considerably more complicated. Thus, as with all stages of the game, accuracy is required. Nimzovich concludes this section by pointing out that, as well as creating a shelter, bridge building is one of the typical elements of endgame strategy used in order to keep one's king as active as possible. Okay, that's the end of part one.